Stalin's rise to power. As in the first section of part three, we're going to focus on the skills needed to produce a good course essay. We'll be looking at useful ways of planning and writing to help you avoid too much narrative in your essay. In this section, the historical focus will be on Stalin's rise to power. We'll look at the topics of economic debate, the battle between Stalin and Trotsky, and the destruction of the right opposition. Stalin's rise to power was a consequence of a series of struggles involving the party leadership between 1922 and 1929. Although Lenin's leadership of the party continued until his death in January 1924, the struggle for power began in the middle of 1922 when Lenin suffered his first stroke, effectively removing him from the centre of politics. The key players in the struggle would be Stalin, Trotsky, Kamyanev, Zinoviev and Bukharin. Tomsky and Rykov also played a role in alliance with Bukharin. Lenin had not left specific instructions on what should happen to the leadership of the party upon his death. He had left a political testament showing his views on party organisation and on key members, adding a postscript a month later criticising Stalin. Stalin was, however, able to go on to become undisputed leader of the party. Questions will focus on the causes of the rise or focus on the debates played out during the struggle for power, in particular the direction of economic policy, and it is here that we are going to start. When you start to consider an essay question, it's useful to decide what type of question it is. That'll help you focus more clearly in your preparation and in the writing of your essay. Most essay questions are descriptive, causal or judgmental. We're going to look at each one in this section. Have a look at the question below. Which question type does it fall into? Pause for a moment and write it down. In what ways did economic debate lead to divisions between party leaders in the years 1922 to 1929? The start of the question is often the clue. Questions that start with in what ways or how tend to be descriptive. As we said in the last section, description doesn't mean narrative. You are being asked to provide an explanation of a particular historical issue. In this case, the ways in which economic debate led to divisions between party leaders. Make sure you also pay attention to dates in the question. It's no good writing about state capitalism, for example, as it's not within the time frame. And no matter how brilliant your analysis, it won't get you any marks. The great thing about course essays is that you know the question beforehand and you can spend time planning your essay. A good plan should take longer to produce than the final essay. By the time you arrive at writing your final piece, you should have done all the heavy brain work. A good plan should provide structure, analysis and selected evidence. Everything you need for a grade A essay. Have a look at this plan. It clearly states the debates over economic policy. So great, it hasn't gone off the point. But has it done enough? If we go back to the three elements of a good plan, there is very little analysis or structure. That means when this candidate is under pressure in timed conditions, they are not only going to have to think about writing their essay, but also what their analysis is and how to structure their answer. Phew! Exam situations are stressful enough already. Give yourself some breathing space. A little more time spent on the plan beforehand will reap the benefits in the end. So, how do we go about putting in analysis? You could plan in a table, as we did in the first section, or you could use a spider diagram with different colours or highlights. As this plan has already been started as a spider diagram, we'll continue with that. First off, let's reorganise the diagram. In a descriptive or explanation essay, it is helpful to structure chronologically. Take care though. Watch out in the exam that you don't start writing and then this happened and next they did this and so on. That's not explaining events, that's providing a narrative. NEP. 
Whilst the introduction of NEP is technically outside of the dates, it is the economic policy in force in 1922 and therefore a key part of the economic debate. It caused division because for many, it was seen as a return to bourgeois values of free trade and individual profit, a significant move away from Marxist ideals. Although it was put to the party by Lenin as a temporary retreat, no one was sure how long this would last for. The key beneficiaries of NEP were peasants and a class of NEP men and kulaks emerged. Concern over the development of this group of profit-making peasants also sparked debate. The scissor crisis of 1923 furthered the economic debate. This highlighted the growing gulf between industry and agriculture and encouraged the government to reduce industrial prices to encourage peasants to produce a surplus. Whilst this solved the immediate problem, it continued as an area of debate as to how the party was going to promote a more industrialised economy. The debate intensified after Lenin's death and was an element in the debate between permanent revolution and socialism in one country. Under permanent revolution, resources would be put towards furthering world revolution. The strength of the world's proletariat would be harnessed to help Russia become a more industrial society. This was opposed by the triumvirate of Stalin, Kamyanev and Zinoviev, who argued that Russia should concentrate on strengthening and developing internally to serve as an example for other countries to follow. Unsurprisingly, socialism in one country was more popular with the party and with Russians, who could see immediate benefit from the policy. By 1925, as attempted revolutions across Europe failed to materialise, Trotsky seemed alone in his opposition to socialism in one country. By 1926 to 27, the debate had shifted towards the pace of industrialization and how to treat the peasantry. The left and right opposition emerged with party leaders, allying themselves according to their views on the way forward in economic development. Those on the left argued for rapid industrialization under a nationally organized plan. They were particularly hostile towards those peasants who had done well out of the NEP and argued for harsher measures to be taken against the peasantry, including forced grain requisitioning to prevent hoarding. Those on the right supported greater cooperation with the peasants, using incentives to encourage a grain surplus to be used as food for the cities and for export. With the money gained from export and taxation to be reinvested in industry, these divisions became clear throughout 1926 to 27. For example, at the Party Congress in October 1926, Trotsky's speech was heard in silence and Bukharin spoke against the united opposition. The economic circumstances were still favourable and didn't seem to justify harsher tactics. Stalin was able to play on this to gain greater support. By 1928, despite reasonable harvests, it was becoming clear that the peasants were hoarding grain to reduce supply and push up prices. This led to shortages in the cities. It also gave Stalin the opportunity to suppress challenges from the right. Party lines shifted from greater cooperation with the peasants towards forcible requisitioning of grain and increased attacks on the kulaks. This did not, however, end debate. Those on the right became increasingly outspoken against the harsh treatment of the peasants. For example, Bukharin wrote notes to an economist in 1928. Accused of factionalism, however, this opposition was short-lived and once Stalin had removed those on the right from office, there was no opportunity for debate. <laughs> that Trotsky would be Lenin's natural successor, as, whilst Lenin was alive, Trotsky was his right-hand man. He was, however, quickly ousted by Stalin. This feature of the power struggle is quite often focused upon, and examination questions often ask you to look at reasons why Stalin was able to triumph over Trotsky. Obviously, the reasons stay the same. 
What is different is the way you use them in your answer, depending on the focus of the question. A top grade answer won't just run through the reasons one by one, it will adapt and evaluate those reasons in relation to the question asked. Let's consider the following question. Write this down. It was Stalin's skill that enabled him to triumph over Trotsky in the struggle for power. Do you agree with this statement? In this question, you are being asked to evaluate how important each reason is in comparison to Stalin's skills. The question is asking your opinion by asking whether you agree with the statement. This is telling you that you need to make a judgment. You could say, yes, I agree, and then go on to write about Stalin's skills. But a really good answer will show your opinion on whether Stalin's skill was the most important factor or whether other factors also played a role. Weighing up the significance of Stalin's skills against these factors. Your essay will need to demonstrate your ability to provide a supported judgment, so appropriate evidence is also crucial. If your essay is going to be clear and concise, then attention to structure is important. Discussing issues randomly will confuse the reader and not show links between them. When structuring essays in which you need to assess one factor in relation to others, you could take one of these two options. Discuss the mentioned factor, in this case Stalin's skills, then move on to discuss other factors, considering whether each is more or less important. Take the issue and qualify it against other issues throughout the essay. In this format, you will be saying, well, on the one hand, but then on the other, when you consider each point. In this case, look at issues linked to Stalin and Trotsky at the same time. Option A is more formulaic, and to be honest, for AS, there is nothing wrong with that. You will still be fulfilling all the criteria of a good essay, and you know that you are writing a safe bet. Option B doesn't always work, and whilst it has the advantage of being less repetitive for the examiner, it is easier to wander off the point, a mistake that could cost you dearly. Let's have a look at the two different approaches, one from structure A and another from structure B. This should help to give you an idea as to which method you prefer. Structure A. Stalin's party positions were a key factor in aiding his rise to power. As general secretary of the party, he was able to promote his own supporters to key party positions and therefore develop a power base that would be difficult to penetrate by his opponents. From this position, it was easier for Stalin to lead party policy and accuse Trotsky of diverging from the party line and encouraging factionalism. As head of Robkrin, Stalin was able to gain greater influence in the government. He was able to take advantage of the growing bureaucracy of the party to gain these positions and use his skills to his advantage. It was therefore Stalin's skills as a bureaucrat that gained these advantageous positions. He was then able to use them to develop support and create a power base to shut Trotsky out. In this essay structure, you would then be likely to move on to discuss another of Stalin's advantages, Perhaps that he was quick to take advantage of situations such as organising Lenin's funeral and suggesting he was Lenin's natural successor. Your paragraph may start with linking words such as furthermore or moreover to show that you are developing your point on Stalin's strengths, creating links between your paragraphs. Discussion of Trotsky's weaknesses would come later on. In structure B, discussion of Stalin's advantages can be contrasted with Trotsky's weaknesses in each paragraph. You would discuss Trotsky's party position as Commissar for Military and Naval Affairs alongside Stalin's role as General Secretary, rather than later in the essay. Here is an example of what you could include for option B. Stalin was a shrewd political tactician and was able to take advantage of the political vacuum created by Lenin's death. 
he was able to manipulate the different factions, playing one against the other to manoeuvre opponents out of leadership contention. He first joined the triumvirate against Trotsky. Then, when Kamyan Evan Zinoviev joined Trotsky in opposition, Stalin created alliances with the right of the party under Bukharin to finally oust Trotsky from the party. Trotsky, on the other hand, made serious errors of judgment that led him to be easily removed by Stalin. He made no use of Lenin's testament or the Georgian incident to discredit Stalin, despite being encouraged to do so by Lenin. He gave up his position as Commissar for Military and Naval Affairs voluntarily in 1925, thus removing himself from the political arena and only source of support, allowing Stalin the chance to continue with the power struggle and operate from within the party, whilst Trotsky was no longer able to significantly influence the party line. Stalin's skills were suited to a power struggle, this was not, however, the only factor in his triumph over Trotsky. Trotsky's lack of political deftness contributed to his own downfall, making it easy for Stalin to outmaneuver him. What both types of answer have in common is their structure. Try to think of your paragraphs in three parts. Firstly, give an opening sentence. Next, provide supporting evidence and then Close with your argument that is related to the question and is consistent with what you have argued in the other paragraphs. What every good essay also needs is an introduction and conclusion, which we're going to look at in our last section. At the 15th Party Conference in December 1927, Trotsky and Zinoviev were expelled from the party and Kamenev lost his position on the Central Committee. This only left Bukharin, Tomsky and Rykov, who were serious challenges to Stalin's authority, and he was able to deal quickly with any threat they posed. Why was Stalin able to outmaneuver opponents on the right so easily? Hopefully by now you've already started to analyse the question. As a causation essay, the top grades will not only give a variety of causes, but they will be able to make a judgement as to which is the most important cause. Another interesting addition to the title that helps to distinguish it from just an average causation essay is the two words on the end, so easily. To be tightly linked to the question, you need to consider all words, and so you will need to address so easily in your answer. In the section on Lenin, the focus of the introduction was to have a snappy start and to signpost the areas for discussion in your essay. Here, we're going to look at setting the essay in context and demonstrating your understanding of the question. The key is not to go overboard and lose focus. You need to be selective. Look at the following points. Which do you think are worth including and which are worth leaving out and introducing later on in your essay? By 1929, those on the right had ceased to have any political influence. There were a variety of reasons why Stalin was able to outmaneuver the right so quickly. Stalin had allied with them to oust the left opposition. Those on the right were Bukharin, Tomsky and Rykov. They formed the right opposition. Stalin was general secretary of the party. Bukharin was a young, rising star within the Communist Party and earmarked by Lenin for a glittering political career. The final two points really are far too detailed for an introduction, but valid to be used in the main part of your essay. The others could be useful, but perhaps in a shortened version. Remember, simplicity is often better than a complex opening to your answer. That could confuse the reader before they even start. By 1927, the only people that stood between Stalin and complete control were those who had helped him extinguish the threats from the left, the right wing of the party led by Bukharin. 
By early 1929, this threat had been neutralized, and the fact that it was so swift and easy was down to the inexperience of the right as much as it was the strength of Stalin. What factors could you consider in the main body of your essay? Let's look at these. By 1927, circumstances were changing and were less favourable to the policy of the NEP, so supported by Bukharin. The harvest was reasonable, but grain hoarding by peasants in an effort to drive up prices meant severe shortages in the cities. This led to forcible grain requisitioning by the OGPU and harsher treatment of the peasants, in particular the Kulaks. Bukharin's commitment to the NEP was unwavering and as a result politically weakened his position as the majority of the party now supported a harder line against the peasants, as promoted by Stalin. Bukharin's reaction to the treatment of the peasants enabled Stalin to accuse him of factionalism. In September 1928, Bukharin published Notes of an Economist, criticising the way the peasants were being treated. Tomsky and Rykov also became increasingly outspoken against the tough measures taken. As these views were now against the party line, Stalin was able to move against them and work to oust them from their party positions. Stalin's position as General Secretary of the party enabled him to develop a solid power base and dictate party line in a way that none on the right were able to match. Tomsky, as leader of the trade unions, potentially had influence over the workers, but was swiftly sacked in 1928. In 1929, Bukharin was forced to resign as editor of Pravda and lost his presidency of the Comintern. In 1930, he and Rykov lost their places on the Central Committee. Political inexperience meant that the right misjudged Stalin and realised too late that they had been used to oust the left opposition in a temporary alliance before he turned on them. By the time Bukharin declared in 1928 that Stalin is an unprincipled intriguer who subordinates everything to the preservation of his own power, he had already been shown up by Stalin and the party faithful to be conspiring against the party line. Conversely, Stalin's abilities were well suited to a power struggle. He was politically shrewd and singularly driven, quick to exploit his opponent's weaknesses. In your preparation essay, you would need to think carefully about your argument. Why were the right destroyed so quickly? Your conclusion should then draw together the evidence and your argument and leave the reader with a good impression. Whilst you don't necessarily have to agree with my argument, Try to identify the elements of a conclusion in the following example. By 1929, Stalin had effectively destroyed all opposition from the right. He was able to achieve this so quickly due to the political inexperience of the right, who realised too late the threat they were facing. Stalin was, however, helped by economic circumstances favourable to a change in policy and the wide party support he enjoyed as General Secretary. It is doubtful whether against these advantages the right would have actually succeeded. The speed with which they fell, however, was due to their own misjudgments. Well done! You've almost reached the end.